This section is called colligative properties, and these are physical properties of solution. They depend on the actual number of solute particles, but not on the kind, and that sounds kind of unusual. We have vapor pressure lowering, boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, and osmotic pressure to share. Three different parts to this section on the YouTube video. Before we get started, we have to say, how are we going to monitor the number of particles of solute? Well, if I have a non-electrolyte, I'll have the same number. If I put in one mole of a molecule of sugar in as a solid, I will get one mole of a molecule of sugar in aqueous solution. So it's an equal number. Here, I'll just write down the number one. If I have an electrolyte, it is going to make ions. If I have one mole of sodium chloride, I will get a sodium cation and a chloride anion, and I will come up with two particles in solution. So I can put in one mole of a substance, and depending upon whether it's a non-electrolyte or an electrolyte, I can come up with a different number of solute particles. So where does this fit in? Well, remember back in 1210, we talked about the phase diagram with solids, liquids, and gases. And we talked about the curves that separated the different phases. Well, what's gonna happen now? We have an aqueous solution, because that's really our liquid, solid, or gas. And what we're gonna do is we're going to add in some solute. It's gonna have an impact on that phase diagram. Vapor pressure will be this line right here. I'll label it with number one. Boiling point, ooh, it's gonna be, where does that stretch over to the right-hand side? Freezing point, oh, where does this stretch over to the left-hand side? Now, if you haven't followed what I've done, that's really what this section is about. Think about ice. When you put salt on ice, you lower the freezing point. That's essentially what's happening here, and we'll talk about it in the three parts of this section. Let's start with vapor pressure lowering and take your eye down to this bottom picture. What we have here is a liquid and sitting above it is a gas and you know from 1210 that they are in equilibrium. Well, what we're doing is we're going to add some solute particles. When we add them in, there they sit in solution and over time, what we will see are fewer gas molecules sitting above the solution. Well, that's where vapor pressure lowering comes from, and it's due to things like intermolecular forces, which is why you had to take 1210. Very simple to do. It's described by Routes Law, where we have a P of solution, which would be what we're looking at here. What is our P of solution? We're going to use our mole fraction of the solvent, that's what they teach in this textbook, and the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. Okay. Before I get started, I wanna make sure everybody sees what's happening on the phase diagram. So here's my very generic phase diagram, and here is my dotted line. The solid line is pure solvent, and they just say, used to say pure solvent. The dotted line is the solution. So when I say vapor pressure lowering, let's choose a temperature and call it room temperature. If I take a line over to the y-axis, there is my pressure of my pure solvent. If I take a line over to the y-axis, there is my solution. So the vapor pressure of the solution will always be less than the vapor pressure of the solvent. So there's new vocab, there's a new concept, and there'll be some new math problems to do. Let's do the easiest one first, okay? They say the vapor pressure of water is 17.5 torr at a given temperature. They put in some glucose, such that the glucose has a mole fraction of 0 0.20. What is the vapor pressure of the solution? Well, Routes Law says take the mole fraction of the solvent, multiply it by the pressure of the solvent. And you're saying, hmm, mole fraction of the solvent. Glucose is the solute. How am I going to find it? Well, the sum of all the mole fractions has to be 1. 1 minus 0 0.200 comes to 0 0.80. So popping into that expression, 0 0.80 
times 17.5 torr gives me 14 torr as my pressure of solution. It is that simple. Please don't make it any harder. The other thing is we're going to have the same one no matter what the solute is. Let's say I had ethylene glycol for my calculation problems and it was 0 0.20. My pressure of solution, it would still be 14 torr. I find that kind of hard to believe. But again, colligative properties depend on the number and not the identity. Just like we had an ideal gas law, we have an ideal Routes law. And it is summarized by the graph right below. My P0 of solvent, let's pretend it's this problem, 17.5 torr. Well, we had like a 0 0.80 mole fraction of the water reading across this way it would turn out to be 14 torr. So again, easy but new, something for you to learn. What will you be asked on your exam? Most likely this type of question, having two volatile liquids, one called A, one called B. But the amazing part is, very simple, you just substitute in Routes Law. So let's work a problem together. We have, as A, we have heptane, C7, as B, we have octane C8. They give you the molecular weight on an exam. You may have to find it in your homework. And they also give you your initial um, pressures. So you already have the pressure for C7816, 791 torr. You already have your pressure for C8, 352 torr. So what you have to find out are these mole fractions. But They've given you the grams, they've given you the molecular weight, so you can find the number of moles and come up with the mole fraction. It takes a bit of paper, so I'm doing it on the next slide. If we have moles of C7, we would be taking 25 grams of C7, one mole of C7 weighs 100 grams of C7, that will give us 0 0.250 moles of C7. I will now find my moles of C8, and it would be 35.0 grams of C8. One mole of C8 weighs 114 grams of C8. That gives me 0 0.307 moles of C8. Now, these are not mole fractions. In order to find the mole fraction, we have to take the moles of whatever it is over the total moles. So let's make the total moles. Moles total are going to be equal to 0 0.557 moles. Okay, so that's our first calculation. Oh, I can already feel the groans. We're not even in person, all right? So what we're gonna do, if you were with me last semester, I would always say, substitute everything into the equation so that all you have to do is type it into your calculator. So here we have our contribution from C7, and I'm just gonna do that. I'm gonna say, this is C7. Here we have our contribution for C8, 0 0.307, 0 0.557 times 352 torr. And I ask you, please, please, please put down your intermediate numbers. You're going to need them for the following calculation. And so here we have our individual contributions from C7 and C8. They give us a grand total of 549 torr. So what this really represents is I have two components in solution, C7, C8, and the pressure that they're exerting is 549 torr. So that's calculation number one. Now in the real world, we're trying to do a separation, maybe you're at a plant, you know, I mean, this takes us way past where we are today, but you wanna know what is the composition of that vapor phase? How much C7 is there? How much C8 is there? Because often this is taking you to a separation. So the way this is phrased is, what is the composition of the vapor in equilibrium with the solution? Think back to that first picture, the third one on the right. Well, the way you do that 
is you take the individual pressures and divide them by the total pressures. That's why I said, write down those individual pressures. Here's where it's hard. I want to be in the classroom. This would be across the board. I could point to it, but I can't pull that off quite as well here. 0 0.647, that's how much C7 there is. 194 tor over 549 tor. That's going to give me a composition of 0 0.353. So, if I'm going to be a real scientist, I'm going to take a look at those two mole fractions. And the vapor that's richer in the component with the higher vapor pressure, here we have the higher, richer component, higher mole fraction, it is going to leave first. Why does it leave first? Well, think of the intermolecular forces of C7 versus C8. C7 has lower intermolecular forces, C8 higher intermolecular forces, higher boiling point, lower vapor pressure. This is chemistry 1210. And this is the basis for separation, okay? What do I have on the last slide? Well, I just gotta say this out loud. If I have a non-ideal solution, I'm not gonna get this straight line. No, no, no. Um, when I do the combination of Routes Law, um, yes, this is ideally what I will get. But here, we have the real world. And again, you will not be tested on this, but if you are an engineer, it's gonna be in your future. Positive deviation, weaker forces, negative deviation, stronger forces, but again, not on the midterm, but it is the real world.